Hello and welcome to this webinar presented by the Massachusetts Rhode Island MGMA in collaboration with the Connecticut MGMA, Delaware MGMA, New York MGMA, Pennsylvania and Virginia MGMA. My name is Julia Linko and I will be your host. Today's presentation is led by Rob Masunis. Rob is a senior program coordinator at Health Centric Advisors. He assists with eligible clinicians in practice on the QPP for MIPS Medicare in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. He previously he provides technical assistance via phone or in person to any practice that needs help with the MIPS program. Previously, Rob worked with an IPA in Rhode Island as a senior data analyst, assisting over 150 physicians on quality metrics and coding. He also played minor league hockey in the early 90s. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's web event. The viewer window is on the right and it allows you to see everything the presenter is sharing on the, on the slide. The control panel is on the left and it's how you can participate in the webinar. The audio panel provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar using microphone and speakers. If you prefer, you can join the audio using your telephone by selecting Use Telephone under the audio drop-down box. The dial-in information will be displayed, including the audio pen. During the presentation, you have the ability to send questions to our staff to the chat box found on the left side of your screen. Simply type in your question and click Send. At the end of the presentation, we will do a question and answer session to answer as many questions as we have time for. As a final reminder, we are recording today's event and you can view a recording of the webinar on the participating MGMA website. Please welcome Rob. Hey Julia, thank you so much for, for that introduction. Um, you know, hopefully we'll we'll get some good good knowledge out of here for everyone who's on this webinar. And if there's any, like you said, any questions at the end um, or even during it, you know, feel free to put them in the chat room. And if, if they're, I think if they're pretty urgent, Julia will will read them out. Otherwise, we'll we'll wait to the end. But um, thanks again for having me. Um, as we go over this. We'll see, you know, we'll start out with kind of what's going on in, in the current year to 2018, and then we'll progress on to the differences between 2018 and 2019. And then at the end, we'll kind of go over some of the, um, you know, what to do, what's the best interest of your particular practice, or if you're a clinician, you know, what makes sense um, for this year and for next year, and kind of, you know, give you some insights of, if you're doing things, maybe there's other ways to get to the certain point values to, to avoid the penalties. Um, what I wanted to mention anyway is, is currently I do work um, in Rhode Island and Massachusetts for Health Centric Advisors. Um, we're one of the DSOs in, in the New England area that, that works with all of the other clinicians, basically practices with 15 or less um, for free. And I know a lot of times that being free doesn't always, you know, cor correlate with a lot of the practices, but um, it is free. And I think once the practices realize that, and they realize what our services do across the country, that it's it's a huge opportunity for you guys to to use us. And like I said, it is free, and, and you know, we'll do anything to guide you in the in the right direction. So um, hopefully, like I said, we'll we'll get a lot of knowledge out of this today. Um, one point, I am not an expert on APM, so I really, 100% of my time is, is spent on small practices. So if there are questions, if you're in AC or APM, um, I may know the answer, but most likely I will not. So I will try to do my best to uh, answer those questions truthfully if, if, if there are any there. Um, what I'll say here is on this, on this page, it's just a disclaimer, this report is basically created for our New England region. Um, so obviously it is, it's good across the country, but we just wanted to get that out there that it is, you know, it's applicable to all states, but the report initially was created uh, for the New England states. So as I mentioned, um, we'll kind of go over, you know, kind of MACRA, MIPS, QPP, whatever you want to call it first, and then we'll go over the, uh, the, the 20, 2019, which is year three proposed rules. And then the last part of it, as I mentioned, is kind of what to do, avoid the penalties. Should you shoot for the incentive? Should you just look to avoid the penalty? You know, whatever, based upon your circumstances in the office. And, and, and like we said at the end, we'll, we'll have some questions. So hopefully most of you 
um, are already participating in this. So a lot of you know the, the basic information here that we'll go over in the next few slides. We'll pass through them quickly, you know, on to really hopefully you understand them. So even here, this is basically the our support center, which I think there are 13 or 12 or 13 across uh, the United States, and essentially we're all the same. Um, just depending on where your location is, you have a particular um, support center to deal with. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, everything we do is free. So it's usually a, like a hard time. I know a lot of the offices get inundated with a lot of phone calls, people trying to sell them stuff. But in the end, everything we do is free. So I will stress this over and over today. If you do need anything, please reach out to your DSO. Um, it is on the QPP site. There is a place where you can check off your state, and it will give you the appropriate contact information. Obviously, if, if you're in New England, my contact information will be at the end here, and, and definitely reach out to me um, if, if need. So we'll kind of go over a little bit of, of MACRA uh, myths. You know, basically for the current year, 2018, it's a 5% penalty if you do nothing. Um, hopefully you guys are all, you know, the reason you're on this webinar is that you want to do something to avoid the penalty, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. But the, the MIPS program really is, is based upon practices that are 15 or less clinicians um, at the practice. If you're in an EPM, usually you're 16 plus, or you're, you're a practice that is part of a, you know, an ACL at this point, the, the advanced payment model. As I mentioned, my, my level of knowledge you know, is a little bit on that, but not, not necessarily that strong, so we'll, kinda, we'll, we'll skip around a little bit on it. So the myth here, as I just looked at the slide, I realized that we forgot to put in the cost, but we'll get into that in a minute anyway. But there are really four categories four domains, as you want to call it, with MIPS. There is the quality measures. There's the meaningful use, which is now called PI. And there is the improvement activity. And the different type of APMs are shown here. And like I said, if, if you are in an APM, hopefully you do know it. What we usually try, if you're not 100% sure, is to, um, because there's participants versus preferred, Usually, if you are a participant, which are all the PCPs of that ACO, then you're usually exempt from MIPS for 2018. But dealing with a ton of clinicians, a lot of them aren't even, don't realize that they're in an ACO, and some think they're in an ACO, but technically they may be a preferred member. So we always say if, if you're not 100% sure to call your administrator um, and find out um, exactly what your role is within the within that organization in ACO, and then we can kind of help determine if you need to um, submit for MIPS or not. But we always say if you're not 100% sure anyway, you can always submit uh, for MIPS. At least you're covering you know your base basis anyway, just in case you never want to get hit with a penalty when if you're doing doing the work. Um, just a couple here. There's a couple reporting options whether you're an individual or group, and we'll get into this later down the road, but not too much has changed from 2018 to 2019, and I think that's nice for the small practices. I think CMS is still understanding that the small practices, especially if you're in a rural area where you know you're, you don't really have the staffing, um, you may not have an EHR, and they still are working with those practices, really trying to make sure that they at least partake in this program so there's, there's no penalties. And, and of course, if many of you have done meaningful use or PQRs in the past, you may be getting hit with penalties this year if you did nothing in 2016. It always pays out in two-year increments. So they lumped the whole pro, you know, all those programs into one. So hopefully you did something in 2017. So in next year rolls around, you're not getting hit with the payment. But if you did nothing, hopefully what we'll go over today will at least give you the incentive to, um, to start doing something for 18. And in the end, what I try to do for my role is really put the blinders on um, anyone who I meet with, whether it's a clinician or an office manager. Because the program, if, if, if you go to the, the CMS website and read about it, it could completely just blow your mind. So what I try to do is put the blinders on and only focus on what you need to do for your particular practice in order to avoid the penalty or go for you know, the highest point value that there is. 
So here, it's basically, you know, who's, who's eligible in 18. It's the same as 2017. The, um, it will change for 2019, and, that, and that's a little bit down the slide anyway. But basically, it's, it's, it's the, you know, the physicians, the nurse practitioners. Um, hopefully, you already know there is a spot on the, on the uh, QPP website where you can type in your NPI, and it will let you know if you're exempt or not. The, the low volume threshold was 30,000 last in 2017. They bumped it up to 90,000 for Medicare Part B claims, and it was 100 patients last year. Now it's 200 Medicare. So in order to partake in into MIPS, you have to be over both of those. So you have to be over 90,000 and over 200. If you fall below one of them, then you are exempt. And there, because they raised this threshold, quite a few practices I know that I worked with um, last year are now um, exempt. So here are the performance categories, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, right now, the quality is worth 50%. The, the old ACI, which was called meetings we use, now it's you know, the promoting interoperability, is worth 25%. Improvement activities is worth 15% and cost is 10%. Um, if you went back to last year, cost wasn't in the category and quality was worth 60%. So you can see that it's, it's come down 10% from last year. So the meat of the topic here is what changes are going on from the current year 2018 to 2019. And what I can tell you is right now CMS, th there are documents out there on it. It's all preliminary. So there are organizations that have, that, that CMS um, has kind of co-opted with. And, and what they've done, they've, they've given notes back to them saying, you know, we, we kind of agree with this, we disagree with this. So I was able to find some, you know, some of the information there to, to, to see if some of these changes really make sense um, that are coming down the pike. So just, just know that these are proposed changes. They're not set in stone yet. We probably won't know until late November exactly what the, um, the final rules will be for 2019. But as I mentioned before, based upon what from 18 and 19, there really isn't a, um, a huge difference. But we'll go over these anyway. And like I said, if there's any questions, you know, put them in the uh, in the chat. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll continue to go here. So there's basically three. Excuse me, three. There's about ten ten items. We'll go over from what's changing from 20, 2018 to 2019. You know, there's other things. But some of the stuff I don't think is very relevant or prevalent to to what you need to know. But we'll stick to these ten. The first one is the eligibility, and as you can see here, as I mentioned before, right now what's included are basically are the physicians, physician assistant, nurse practitioners. What is changing is that in year three, 2019, they're adding these four, four types. You can see physical therapist, occupational therapist, the clinical social worker, and the clinical psych psychologist. What it's going to be curious to see is how many of these actually are over the threshold um, that 90,000 and 200 Medicare Part B patients. So it'll be, I think the, there's usually two iterations that come out annually. One is in May and one is in, I think, November, -ish, you know, late October, November, and that's usually how our groups um, come in contact with who's eligible and who's not. So they'll be curious to see how much um, the eligible clinicians go up from 18 to 19. So just know also that, that part of our contract with CMS is that we, we do have to reach out to everybody who is eligible. So hopefully um, your office has been reached out to by somebody, whether it's, it's an email or you know someone called and spoke to the front desk or they left a voicemail. So, just know that if, if you do hear something for free on MIPS, um, it probably is true because, you know, like I said, we, we are working and, and we're required by CMS to, to try to contact um, every, every office that's out there. Of course, the issue is a lot of times 
we don't necessarily have the correct numbers and, and there's a lot of research involved or if practices move. So, you know, we do our best to try to reach out to everybody. Hey, Rob. Sorry, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Do you mind just speaking up a little bit? Some people are having trouble hearing you. Um, yes, and you certainly. sound just a little bit muffled, so. Sure. Yeah, I will try to do my best there. Hopefully no one will, uh, will complain. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll skip over to the next um, slide, which the second one here is the performance threshold. Thre threshold. Sorry about that. So the current rule in 2018 is that you need 15 or more points to avoid the penalty. Um, obviously, if you don't get the 15-point penalty, I mean the 15 points, then you're getting hit with a 5% penalty. And I know that can be, you know, pretty substantial to to many of the practices out there. If you do hit the 70-point plateau this year, and it's very, it's the same thing as what was in 17, there is a exceptional performance bonus out there. I do know that if if you do get it, it is a, you know, there was a small increase um, to, to your to your Medicare payment. What's changing for 2019 is that the, in order to avoid the penalty is basically doubling. It's going to go up to 30 points. So it is a pretty substantial increase, especially when you think back to 2017 when it was three points. So we'll get into it a little bit later on what you should, what could you do to get to those to that point to avoid the penalty? And they're talking in 2020 to maybe jumping that up to 70 points, but I can't imagine that that would be the case because that would be a huge a huge increase. What they've also talked about is um, changing that exceptional bonus to 80 points. So instead of going you know instead of getting 70, it'd have to be up to 80. The, um, the there are some some feedback on that is you know. 80 points seems kind of drastic and high because if, if, if you're a, a very high-performing clinician but you don't have an EHR, how do you get to that 80 points? We also know that many, many specialty practices are on a, a regular PCP-driven um, EHR. So they're, what they're doing isn't really necessarily what they need to do. So, you know, I use the example, I have a lot of podiatrists who are, who are doing influenza, influenza or the pneumococcal, you know, just, to, just because that's what the EHR can do. So it, it may be difficult to get to that 80-point plateau um, next year. The third one here is, is the low volume threshold. And right now, as I mentioned, it's, it's greater than or equal to 90,000 in Part B allowed charges or greater than the 200 you know, Medicare beneficiaries. It's essentially going to stay the same for next year. Those aren't going to go away, but they're adding a third one that says, you know, if, if you're less than or equal to 200 you know, professional services under the physician fee schedule, then you can also um, be excluded. So I know that, that Medicare came out with that. I've had a lot of questions on the physician fee schedule. I don't really want to go into today, but just you know, be wary. And just know that the iteration that will come out of eligibility, as I mentioned before, will probably be around April or May. So you know, if you're not sure, definitely go on to the, the QPP site, plug in your NPI, and it, 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 it should let you know. Um, there is some talk because right now the uh, determination periods are just, it, it, they're kind of out there. It basically goes from September 1st of 16 through August 31st, 17. Um, that's based on the first iteration. So if you meet that criteria, then you're in this. If you're, if you, if you're under one, you know, if you don't meet one of them, then you're exempt. The, the second one is 9117 to 83118. That'll be part of the iteration number two. Now, there's talk to say, listen, can we just have one time period? So that way, everyone knows right off the bat whether they're in or out of this of the current year. So hopefully, CMS will kind of take that to heart and just you know find the one time period and look at it. And if you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. So um, hopefully, that'll be revisited. The other big one that's going on here that they're talking about is an opt-in. So. Essentially what it means is that you are technically exempt from MIPS. There's really no current rule for this year. It's, it's happening in 2019. And what they're saying is, is if you meet one of the two or one of the three, then 
you can opt in. So you can you know, either go through a third-party vendor to submit your data, or you can submit through your EHR, through a registry. You can submit on the, on the QPT portal. But some of the issues that have come up is because this is a budget-neutral program. So part of what happened, and I know there will be some notes in it later, is that I think 90, 91 or 92 percent of all the clinicians across the United States participated last year. So there's only X amount of money that goes out based upon this program. So part of our questioning is, okay, if all of a sudden you have a ton of clinicians who say, I'm going to opt in, well, how does that, how does that adjust the payment for all the clinicians who are already in it? Um, the other aspect is more for, for our side as a DSO because, as I mentioned before, part of our contract with CMS is to reach out to 100% of all the eligible clinicians. Well, now all of a sudden if we have opt-in, you know, part of our role is do we need to then reach out to those clinicians who are opting in and how do we know about it? So there is, there is a little bit of feedback on this and you'll be curious to see what, you know, what happens once the final rule comes out. But Currently, right now, you do have the option to opt in, um, especially if you're a high performer and you've been doing a lot of these quality measures or meaningful use in the past. It makes sense that you can partake in the program. Um, one of the things that CMS has actually done a pretty nice with is a small practice bonus. So in the current rule, as long as you partake in any part of MIPS this year, you receive five extra points. So if you do your improvement activity, if you, even if you did one quality measure, you're going to get five bonus points on top of that. So it, it does make it a little bit easy, easier to reach you know, the 15 points to avoid the penalty. So right now, when you get, as long as you partake, they just take those five bonus points and add it on to the top of your score. What they're saying for 2019 is that you still get five bonus points for doing anything in MIPS, but what they're going to do is they're going to take those five bonus points and put them towards your quality. So it's not as easier, you know, not as easy to get the full five points because if you know if you do very well in your quality measures, then you may not even get the five bonus points. But my my thought is if, if you're doing very well in very well in quality, you're probably doing very well in, in all the other aspects to MIPS. So you probably don't really need the five points. But nevertheless, um, there still will be five points, at least five points granted to you for a small practice. So as I mentioned at the beginning, it's nice that CMS is still trying to you know get the small practices involved um, in the program. The next big piece, if you do have an EHR, I know it's, it's an if. I work with a ton of practices who are still on paper. Um, you know, many who are, who are on the EHR now, most of the EHRs that I've worked with have already gone over to, to the 2015 certification. So the, what that means is if you're on an EHR, EMR, however you want to go by it, that that particular software needs to be updated and it needs to be 2015 approved. So right now in the current rule, you can be 2014 or 2015, um, have, have that cert for this year. What they've done this year is that if your EHR is 2015 um, approved, then you will get 10 bonus points added to your PI, your meaningful use portion of MIPS. So it certainly makes it um, a nice change of pace where, you know, just by using the EHR, you're getting bonus points. Um, and it's 2015 EHR. So it makes it much easier to get the full 25 points toward the PI. What they're saying for 2019 is that if you are on the EHR, it must be 2015 certified. And they are taking the bonus points away because obviously you have to use a 2015 certified. So pretty, pretty cut and dry there. The, the next piece here is the submission mechanisms. And a lot of what this means anyway in the current, current rule is that if you're going to do, for instance, your quality, quality measures, your quality measures have to be submitted all to the same format. So if you're using a registry, all the measures have to be done through the registry. Or if you're doing cleans, all measures have to be due cleans. Or if you're using an EHR, 
the EHR either has to create the file for you or it has to send it directly to CMS. What they're saying for next year is they're going to allow you know, multiple submission ways. So I think this will benefit a lot of the specialty practices because as I mentioned before, the specialty practices just have a hard time, first of all, trying to find measures that they can use. There's you know, some, when you get in to like radiology, there's not a ton of measures out there. And then, and I always use the example right now of um, a podiatrist. I have a, a bunch of podiatrists who are on paper. They, a lot of them have, you know, obviously they have diabetic patients that come in. One of the, so what they're doing is they're using claims to submit. And one of their easiest measures is the measuring the foot if you're diabetic. And unfortunately, that particular measure can't be submitted via claims. It has to be either through an EHR or a registry. So next year, if they were to have an EHR, they could submit that one separate from you know, some other measures. So it allows you to submit you know, two or three measures through claims, maybe two to three measures through a registry. You know, I think this will really help the specialty practices. For the, for the typical PCP, I don't think it's going to help too much, but as I mentioned, the specialty practices will, will certainly um, benefit from this one. So next piece here is the quality measure updates. As I mentioned before, currently the, the weight to the final score is 50%. That is going to drop down to 45% next year, and cost, which is 10%, will bump up to 15 Right now, there's, and I've had the examples of what happens if you can't find measures. I know there's, I, I worked with a couple groups. Um, there's subgroups of n neurology and nephrology and they, what, they, what their CPT, their visit code is, there's not one measure that they can use because nothing falls into that category. So if that is the case, they can actually take your points um, for quality and, and hopefully move them around to your improvement activity or if you're on an EHR to, to, to the meeting to use the PI. So it's something you know, that, that will also carry over for next year. The other nice thing that if you have an EHR or a registry, if you're using one of those two, they're giving bonus points out. So they're, they're calling it end-to-end. -end. And what we say is just, are you reporting for the full calendar year 2018 or 2019? What they will do for every measure that you do, and I'm assuming you do, hopefully you're doing at least six, they will give you a bonus point, um, one bonus point for each measure for submitting the full end-to-end -end reporting year to, for the full year. Currently, if you're doing a high outcome measure, you get two bonus points for this year. And what they're doing is they're taking that two bonus points away next year. They're discontinuing it to the high priority, but you will just get the one bonus point for the end-to-end -end reporting. So when you think about it, if you do, okay, you know, if, if you're doing okay on your measures, you're probably going to get, you know, maybe seven extra bonus points this year because what you still have to have one of those high priority measures. So you figure six plus the one gives you seven bonus points. So it makes your score a little bit easier. And even for next year, as long as you're sending the full year's worth of data, you're going to get six bonus points on top of your quality. So it certainly um, should make you know getting to that 15 points this year or 30 points next year a little bit more achievable. So that way you're you're avoiding the penalties. So not too much for the quality measures. There's still you know, roughly 200 or so out there. Just be wary that you know which measures you're doing because some measures can only be submitted via claims. Some can be only through an EHR. Some can be the whole the whole gamut. So you just want to make sure that you know which measures you're doing and what is the appropriate submission method right now because the last thing you want to do is you know work on a particular measure and then to come find out you can't you can't use it through the do the appropriate submission method you were going to do for this year. Next year won't be, you know, shouldn't be an issue. So as we move on to the um, improvement activities here, um, currently it's 15. It's 15 percent of the total score of MIPS. That will not change for next year. 
they are proposing that there should be about six more. I think currently there's around 115 or so, and they are going to modify 15 of the existing ones. They're removing um, this talk of removing one. I don't know which one they are removing, but what I can tell you is that this is probably the easiest way for 2018 to avoid the penalty. So if you're not sure how you're going to get the 15 points, um, finding an improvement activity that, that works for you um, out of the 115 is really the easiest way for this year. What I can tell you is in the Massachusetts and Rhode Island area, out of the 115, there's probably three that like 99.9% .9 of all the practices are, are using one of the three. Um, it's 24-7 access. There is, are you accepting new Medicaid patients and you show no favoritism towards scheduling visits and giving any um, diagnosis out or, or results? And there's the drug monitoring program. So if you prescribe op opioids, are you logging on to your local um, system in the area to make sure that, you know, has a patient been prescribed any of the opioids, you know, recently or whatever? So those really are the three easiest ways. So. This, what I'll stress back from the beginning is that if, if you're having a hard time saying, all right, how do I get to 15 points, this is probably the easiest way. And of course, if you can do an improvement activity, the next question is how do you attest for it? So, you know, obviously you can always hire a third-party vendor to work with you or, and I'll, I'll go over it later on, but there is the EIDM account, which is the enterprise portal through CMS for the Medicare. Um, it is free to log on there, and once you log on there, they take the same credentials to log on to the QPP portal, and that's where you can attest to this. Um, the QPP portal won't be up and live until late, probably January, and usually stays open, I think, until the first week of, of April. So what I'll stress even later on is if you need to do that, definitely reach out to your local organization. Um, I know here in New England we have, you know, we have directions written up on how to do it. We also do a lot of on-site where we'll sit with the practice and, and help them, guide them through this process so they at least have it created. And I do stress if you can get the EIDM created well in advance before you have to test, it makes a life a lot easier. So the last um, big component of what's changing from, from 2018 to 2019 is the PI, the Promoting Interoperability, which was known as ACI last year, which was known as Meaningful Use for all the other years. So obviously you have to have an EHR to do this. If you don't have an EHR, currently you can't do it. There is, um, there is an exception, and I, I think later on down the road I, I talk about this a little bit later, but there is an exception where you can go on and say you are a small practice, that you don't have an EHR, and what we're hoping is that they're going to move the 25 points um, to quality. But currently, what, what's going on here is that if you do have an EHR, the current rule reads that you must do four or five of the base measures. And if you're 2014 certi certification through your EHR, there's four base measures that you have to do. If it's 2015 cert, then there are five base measures that you have to do in order to even participate in this. Um, that, and, and it's 25%, it's as I mentioned, the 25% part of MIPS is going to stay the same for next year. And as I, as I mentioned right here, there's the reweighting. So if you're non-patient facing, if you work in a hospital, those CMS knows behind the scenes it's it's on there that your points will be you know directed or reweighted towards the quality portion. What they're proposing for 2019 is that they want to possibly eliminate the, the base measures, which I think would actually make it a little bit easier. And I think currently, if you do your Medicaid um, meaningful use, it would kind of harmonize and, and 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 go just just how that is now. So. It should make it a little bit easier. The scoring methodology, I think, will change a little bit. So your, you know, every, the score will add up to 100, it, and it, it makes it a little bit easier what CMS is proposing, especially if you don't really understand how the scoring is done through CMS. Because even currently now, just by doing the base measures, 
you get half of the 25 points, and then everything else is, is, is scored upon to, to get the full 25%. So it should make the scoring a little bit easier. And as I mentioned, the reweighting, um, if you're not patient facing, or, you know, it, obviously, like I think if you were in Houston in 2017, because of the flooding, I think you became, you know, you didn't have to worry about it as well. So if there's uncontrollable circumstances in the area. But just know that this is probably going to going to be one of the, the, the most drastic changes from 18 to 19 out there. They, there is also talk of adding two measures to the e prescribing. So if you currently do meaningful use, you know, one of the first ones out there is the e prescribe. And they're, they're talking about basically adding two more kind of um, drug monitoring for the opioid epidemic out there. Of course, there's a lot of feedback coming out there saying, you know, will doctors really understand this? Will the EHRs be able to track it? So just just know that the feedback is, is there's a lot of strong feedback on this for 19. So it'll be curious to see if CMS takes that feedback and kind of maybe does small changes um, to, the, to the PI for next year. But we'll find that out hopefully in the next month or two. So the next thing I want to talk about is kind of, you know, we what's your best alternative? What should you do for 18 and 19? Should you, you know, go for it? Should you just look to avoid the penalty? It's always questions that, that come up to me when I'm out and about. So just a quick, quick talk. The budget neutral program, like I mentioned, you can see that 91% of all the clinicians across the United States participated last year, which I think is outstanding. I don't, I don't think CMS really expected that, that it was going to be that high. So it was a plus or, plus or minus 4% last year. So I think a lot of doctors, what happened, um, who did very well, who got to the 100 points, were like, oh, I did well, I'm going to get to 4%. But because so many doctors participated, the max payout was 2.02%. So what happened initially when, when people got their scores and how much percentage they were getting back, there was quite a bit of feedback from the docs who did well. They were angry um, because they put a lot of extra effort into this, and all I'm getting is 2% back. So this is kind of where I want to talk about a little bit. Um, as you get into 2018 and 2019, 2018 is you know, plus or minus 5%, and what we're saying here, and just know that there is a disclaimer on this because it's it's based upon what you know what happened in 17 is that for 18 when it's plus or you know plus plus five percent if you get a full hundred points, what we're thinking is that the percentage might be around two and a half to three percent. And why it's a little bit more than half as compared to 17 is because the low volume threshold was raised, so now you have less clinicians. Um, going for that money in 2018. Of course, in 2019, when it's 7 to minus 7 percent, um, we're still seeing roughly half, but now you have all those four new types of clinicians who can partake in MIP, so it, it might be more of the three and a half. So it's always like, what should I do? You know, should I really put a lot of effort into this? Um, just to have a couple quick points here. You can take 15 points in 2018. It's most likely going to be 30 points in 2019. Do you have an EHR, right? If a lot of people assume if I don't have an EHR, I can't partake in this. You certainly can. There's ways that we can help you. That's why I say from the beginning, if, if, if you have any questions on this, you're not sure, um, reach out to your local DSO. We can certainly guide you in the right direction because as you can see, as you get into 19 when it's seven, you know, a seven percent hit in 2020, it's nine and 11 in 2021. That could certainly put a lot of practices or clinicians just they won't be able to operate anymore. You know, it's you don't want to get hit with that penalty. And there are ways and easy ways that we can guide you in that right direction to avoid the penalty. The last one here is should you use claims? Yes, and we'll go over that in a second if you don't have an EHI. It's not as bad as you think it is. So what here is I gave a couple of examples of avoiding the penalty. In 2018, as I mentioned, you need 15 points. The easiest way, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is do your improvement activity. If you do, you need either one high measure or two medium measures. It's, it's really the simplest way. Or 
you do six quality measures. And as a small practice, as long as you have one person that falls into the numerator, you're guaranteed three points. And that will also carry over for next year. So as long as you get one person and you close their gap and they're, you know, they're eligible, and just know that if you're doing claims, it's Medicare-only patients. If you're on an EHR, it's all lines of business. So just kind of know which, you know, which role you're going. Or you could complete your, you know, your, your PI there. But obviously, if you're doing the last one, you're probably doing your quality measures. And a lot of e the EHRs can submit your data to CMS directly. So then you can usually choose your, your IA. So usually, it's the, it's, it's the practices who are just you know, getting by that really want to avoid the penalty. Um, in 2019, how do you get to 30 points? And, and this is what I, a lot of practices who I'm working with now, especially, you know, the practices who are on paper, is, okay, let's do an improvement activity for this year, and let's start working on claims over the next couple months of the year. And what I tell everyone is, even if you've never done claims, maybe you start with two or three, you figure out what the, what the G codes are, those non-billable codes, and you, you kind of implement it into your workflow. So that way when 19 starts, you know, maybe you, you've already worked in those two or three. You implement the three other measures. Um, you can certainly get the point value to hit 30. Because when you think about it, you have 15 points for doing your improvement activity. As long as you do, you know, MIPS some some sort of fact, you know, fashion next year, you're going to get those five extra bonus points attributed to your quality measures. So that's why we say at least improvement activity and the measures should certainly, you know, help you. On the 2019, I have six quality measures here. Obviously, when you're doing six, you need to do well on them. So in order to get 30 points, you know, you need to to average five points on those six measures. So just know that. There is ways, even if you did fail, you, you did, you know, average, you're going to get the bonus points. Plus, if you submit, you know, a full year's worth of data, then you're also going to get extra bonus points. So it's just, um, you know, things to, to think about. And this is why I stress over and over, if you're not 100% sure, reach out to us. We'll put the blinders on. We'll guide you in the direction that you need to do. And, of course, the last one is you can do your, your PI and IA. Um, but usually if you're at that level, you know, you're a high-performing practice and you don't really need too much of our um, you know knowledge or, or feedback there the the big question that then arises from all this what should I do is it worth it and as I mentioned before you know it's that cost benefit so when you think of like this year five percent and next year seven percent is the two and a half three percent the three and a half, four percent next year worth the time and resources that are, are needed to do it. So I, I have an example, you know, there was a podiatrist that I was working out with in Springfield, Massachusetts. They hired a third a third party um, vendor last year where they were typing in the names of every patient for every measure for the full year. What they told me was what they got back, and I, I think they were like around one and a, and a half percent is what they got back. The time and you know and money spent for overtime probably was you know like tenfold for what the clinician got back. So what the, what we what we came up with the idea was to add a little MIPS MIPS section on their encounter form, and now they have the G codes because they do billing internally, so it's going to save them a lot of time. So it's always like when you're thinking about the incentive, you know, do you have the staffing? A lot of solo practitioners don't really have the time. They just want to, to, to do the least amount as possible to, to avoid the penalty. Um, you know, one of the big things, if you do have any EMR, are you checking the appropriate buttons? I mean, we all know, especially as clinicians, they, they may put it in, in the note. But the way the EHR gives you credit is you have to check something or, or put in a you know specific diagnosis code. So you want to make sure that you exactly know how the EHR is scoring you. Um, and as I mentioned, the time and effort is is it worth all the extra effort um, to get 100 points or 90 points or 80 points? You know, is that percentage worth all the extra effort? And then, you know, another big aspect of this is what is your Medicare percentage to your practice? You know, I have a, a couple of big practices that it's like 60, 70% and they're, you know, they're, 
their growth of Medicare is excess of a couple million dollars. So it makes sense for them to change their work workflow to, to get the highest score as possible because that's a lot of money for them. You know, and obviously if if your Medicare percentage is 25, 30 percent, then maybe you just continue on your same workflow. At least you know you can avoid the penalty and go from there. But obviously it's it's you know every, every doctor is unique and different. Um, it's something that you personally have to really think about what what makes the most sense. Um, this is like a little bit of a miscalculator, so this this could help you. And I know unfortunately a lot of times um, it comes down to dollars and cents for doctors. This particular um, it's it's a third party vendor. It's and what this is based on is if you had grossed one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in Medi in you know Medicare Part B the last year, and you actually got a hundred hundred points on this, and what it does it kind of dictates what it would be for twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty the three years here. But really, what I want to focus on is the last line, where if you did nothing, that would be your penalty. So as you get into twenty nineteen. You know, an eight thousand dollar, eighty five hundred dollar penalty. I mean, that, as I mentioned back a little while ago, that could put practices out of business um, if you're getting hit with that. And you think in twenty 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 when it's, you know, you're probably looking at ten, eleven thousand for a hit. So, my suggestion to everyone is definitely talk to someone if you're not sure. There are ways that you can easily avoid the penalty. Um, the next one here basically lists. All the DSOs across the United States, um, each state obviously has one. Reach out to them. This is all on the QPP site. Um, you know, we can certainly send out these links if needed, but um, everything we do is free. Personally, I do a ton of on sites. I find it really easy, and I find it much more helpful to kind of build that relationship. You know, and I, I stick with my clients. Um, try to email them monthly, and if any time they need help, they know they can reach out to me. So just know that you know we're out there. It is a free service, and we certainly will support you in the best best that we can. So, um, is there any questions or anything, Julia? You wanna? Yep, we have a couple questions coming in, and a reminder um, to use the chat box if you have any questions here for Rob. So the first question, has there been any discussion about expectations for HR, EHR who haven't upgraded um, yet by 2019? I, I, there, there is a possibility that you could be um, exempt. There, there could be that um, exception. Which I, I can't think of the word right now, but exempt um, for it. So it's one of those that, as I said, the the meaningful use portion really is, I think, going to be the biggest component, the biggest changes from 2018 to 2019. But I, I believe if your if your EHR will not update, there is a possibility that you, you could be exempt from that. Now, that's something that if you are exempt, you have to go on and fill out. It's like a two minute like little survey. Um, but if you take that chance that CMS could say yes or no to it. Perfect. And then. Um, Next question, what happens if you don't upgrade to 2015 certified EHR? Is there an all or nothing situation? I assume the question is if you if you don't if you don't have an EHR currently, no. It's it's not going to you you won't be penalized like right now there is that exception which we we're hoping that will actually CMS will approve that will take your points over. But if you are on a 2014 certification and you're not upgrading you know, two, basically two things. Hopefully, if you fill out the exceptions online, it, CMS will approve it. I don't know. Um, hopefully, all the EHRs though do you know realize the rules of what's going on that you have to use a 2015 certification, and they will update. But I don't. I don't really have a definitive answer on that because just because the, the PI is really the the biggest. You know, I think there's a lot of just a lot of questions on really what's going to happen with that for next year. Awesome. Um, next question that came in, when does the EHRT 2015 um, implemented to get the bonuses in 2018? If we upgrade at the end of this month for 2015, will that get us the bonus points? Technically, you're supposed to be on it for a full year. So it's one of those when you 
when you see, it's, and, and anyone who's attested on the QPC site, you just never know because it asks you what, when you attest in, you know, January, February, March, it asks you what, you know, what current version are you on? So I can't really give you a definitive answer there, but usually you choose the most recent, recent version you're on, and if, if it, I think if you choose a 2015 certification, it would be the bonus point, but I'm not 100% sure how that will work. Um, when you go to the test. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so Lisa provided some information for um, the folks in Connecticut that can reach out to her. Um, okay, next question. Will you be able to report 2019 quality measures from a 2014 CHRT? The PI category won't work, but will qualify, or will quality? I, I believe it, it, it should. Hopefully, your um, your EHR will be able to produce. It's called a QRDA3 file. As long as they can produce that file, um, either you can submit it directly to, to you know to, um, to the QPP portal, or they'll be able to send it directly to the CMS. But that's a great question. I I know that the like, I mean they know that the PI won't be able to work, but the quality measure shouldn't be an issue. And the other thing I can say is, is anyone who's out there from Connecticut, Lisa is, I work, you know, I work with her. She's excellent. Um, so if you have any questions in Connecticut, definitely reach out to Lisa. Great. And um, to answer your question, uh, Jason, the slides will be provided. The um, state that you registered with the webinar will send an email with the slides and the um, recording. Not sure an exact time frame of when they will be sent out. And if anybody has any other questions, reminder, you can use the chat box, um, type them in, and Rob will be able to answer them. You can give it a few minutes, Rob, to see if anyone types anything else in. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, hopefully a lot of people, have, as I mentioned at the beginning, that they're already, you know, doing MIPS. It's not brand new to them. and you know, if, if you get stuck on something because, you know, as, as, if, as if you're in school, there's really no stupid question because the program itself can just be so overwhelming, especially if you're in a small practice and you've got 17,000 other things going on. This really isn't your priority. So there's a ton, ton to it. And that's why we say, you know, reach out to, you know, one of your, you know, wherever your local group is, and we can certainly, you know, set up some time. And, and as I mentioned, it's like, and I don't know how other groups across the country, but here in New England, we, we definitely do a ton of on sites, and I find it to be a very, you know, rewarding on both ends. Great. So if there are no other questions, we'll wrap up today's event. Thank you for attending today's webinar. The recording will be distributed to all registrants through email. If you attended today's webinar as a non-member, please inquire about membership opportunities through your local MGMA chapter. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be sent a brief survey that will ask you to rate the webinar on a five-star scale. A separate survey will be sent to your email for a more in-depth look at today's program. That concludes our webinar. Thank you again for attending, and have a great afternoon.